Hello everyone and welcome to my public accountability meeting for North Yorkshire Police. I am Commissioner Zoe and I will be chairing the meeting today. So turning to our agenda, um, attendance and apologies. So I don't believe we have any so far. Um, agenda item two, minutes of the previous meeting and actions. Well, there's no actions and the minutes uh, from the previous meeting are recorded and published onto the OPSCC website. Agenda oh, item sorry, three. We, we do have one set of uh, apologies, so just jump in there, just from Mabs are saying today from the Deputy Chief Constable. Thank you very much, Tom. Thank you. And that, I'm sure that's been noted. OK, so agenda item three, questions from the public. Now, we do have one question. So I think it will um, appear on the screen in one moment and I'll read it out. OK, so the question is from Mr White in Whitley and it's about speeding motorists. Our community is plagued with speeding motorists. The only enforcement we have is the occasional visits from the camera safety van. At most one or maybe two hours a month, some months we have no visits. We have been fed suggestions that fixed speed cameras will be deployed in the county. What progress is there with this? When will the first fixed speed cameras be deployed? Please can my village be included in any pilot initiatives? If none have been yet deployed, what is preventing them being used? Thank you. So I'm going to hand over to Tom in my office to answer that question, please. Yep, certainly, Zoe. Thank you. So um, uh, currently North Yorkshire has a has a policy um, in, under which we, we don't uh, deploy um, fixed speed cameras. Uh, and instead, we use uh, our safety camera vans, which are deployed across the um, the, the county and the city uh, to uh, enforce uh, speed limits. Um, we have uh, been working towards um, a, a speed in, um, uh, enforcement review um, uh, as a partnership approach to looking at the way in which um, uh, road safety is, is carried out uh, as a whole, um, but in particular in the way in which um, we look to, to enforce um, speed limits uh, across the area. Uh, part of that, um, which has been ongoing over the last year, has been um, a real partnership approach, first of all, around a new road safety strategy, which looks at the approach to road safety as a whole. Um, uh, and then secondly, uh, in terms of discussions around developing um, terms for, for uh, a review of the way in which we approach this, which would obviously have to take into account the way that we look at um, uh, speed safety concerns, uh, as well as then what enforcement measures are put in place. Um, of course, this is this isn't you know, it's a, it's a complex uh, space uh, and actually some factors of our area make it even more complicated. Um, it's not just a case of uh, deciding one day that we, we can do these things and, and, and implementing the next. We have to look at the infrastructure requirements uh, and obviously in a rural county that can be quite difficult uh, at times. Um, uh, but we also need to look at what the best approach is um, across the area. Um, so we are approaching uh, a point at which we can um, uh, look to publish a terms of reference for uh, conducting uh, our review. Uh, and we would obviously look for a, a strategic partner to, to help us um, do that independently. Uh, and that will look at all options. Um, use of fixed speed cameras, average speed cameras, uh, safety camera vans, as we currently do, uh, and, and other methods. Um, uh, and uh, then we would look at how uh, whatever came out of that review would be uh, implemented. So unfortunately, uh, it is not um, a, 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 a quick process, um, but it is a robust process that we're going through, and we are looking at this very carefully. Uh, we hope that you know, the the review would be complete within um the next six months uh, after which we can start planning for for whatever comes next um but that obviously we, we have to see how that that pans out and what the, that review uh produces great thank you very much tom and thanks mr white for your question so agenda item four and that's the North Yorkshire Police presentation and that's been, going to be done and welcome to uh, Leanne, Fran and John. So welcome to the meeting. I think I'm going to hand over to Leanne first, so over to you. You're just on You're mute. On. Sorry. Thank you Commissioner. I will just put up the presentation and then Fran is going to start and then John and then myself. Okay. Oh, 
Has that come up, everybody? Yeah, it, it has. Yeah. Yes. Yes, yes. yes. Okay, so we'll just uh, we'll go straight straight into the investigations part. If that's all right. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm Fran Norton, the Detective Superintendent in North Yorkshire Police. And one of my roles is to be in charge of the investigations and the quality and standard of, of investigations. So it's just first to mention our investigation uh, policy and procedure. Uh, when the uh, child protection inspection happened, um, the, the inspectorate found there were some perhaps gaps in our allocation of crimes and resources and is the right crime being allocated to the right person with the right skills. So what we did is refresh the investigation policy um, and put some additional um, safeguards in so that we knew that the right officers were getting the right crimes and that victims of crime were getting the best possible service. So with that, what, well, what's different really? Well, we put um, some differences in which were um, make it really clear about the roles and responsibility on each rank. So what, what each individual was expected to do at all the different ranks. But we also introduced a new allocation uh, policy, which hadn't been um, in there or hadn't been quite as clear before. Uh, and that started in June this year. So it's still relatively new. But what that did is mean that... Um, Firstly, number one, looking at allocation and secondly, really looking at quality. So when a certain uh, uh, level of crime types could go to a uniform officer, but it could go to a CID officer. And where is that decision making held? So what we've done is make it made a real clear allocation process, which is documented with the rationale on of which officer that should go to and the reasons for that, which is now um, uh, uh, an office manager has that role of um, making sure that those crimes are in the right place. Uh, which we're feeling is really working really well and has been a real additional benefit to the investigation policy. What that has also bring, uh, brought is uh, the quality as well. So our um, office managers are, are what we call PIP2, which is accredited, which is um, uh, has the skills and abilities to add um, some extra uh, direction to um, in PIP1, which is like response officers, to help those response officers in the direction of their, uh, their crimes and to steer them the right way. So not all crimes need um, reallocating every day, but what they sometimes do is need that additional support from with those specialist skills and that's what's now in place so with regard to sort of the quality and compliance well I just want to assure uh, the public really that um, crimes like rape uh, will always go to the accredited officers there's no dispute there so even this allocation process that's very much uh, one of their priority offence which will always be dealt with by our um, uh, people that have been skilled in that area and been on the the correct um, qualifications in relation to crime investigation what I did bring in then, what I did notice is that um, some of our officers just needed a little bit more um, direction in relation to how they completed the crime. So it was really clear what had been done. So what I named the four steps guide to investigations was a way that officers could have a prompt and aid. So officers on the front line that might not be as experienced actually know that if they just really clearly put out what's completed, what is outstanding and made that really obvious, when are they going to complete that so that both they and the member of the public know and then tell that victim, tell victims of crime when they're going to be updated. So that four steps seems to have really aided our front line in particular and what is evident on all the crime reports now when, they, when they're looked at. Again, though, we need to make sure we are evaluating that and making sure, you know, is it really working? And that's in train now to make sure that we have a review by our business insight department to make sure that's working and we will get those results soon. Um, so what it has done is standardise the processes. We've now got like a suite of templates where the officer knows they have to do an initial investigation plan. The supervisor knows they have to do a supervisory template. The finalisation template is there. So there's various templates, which, again, the officers are really clear of what's expected of them, which I think we, uh, we've really filled that gap. With regard to knowledge and skills, though, we do know we have a gap. We do know in the workforce, uh, just like they do nationally, we have a detective shortage, which sits at approximately 37 offices now where we have that gap. We also know many of our officers are trainee detectives um, and very keen to learn, but, you know, do, you know, our, our trainees. Um, but what um, what we do have is um, plans in place to address that gap, to address that shortage. And that's, there's various things underway, transferee campaigns, succession planning, making sure that though we're identifying um, the talent on the front line. So as soon as our response officers have that indication and will that they, we think they could be good crime investigators, they now are part of our what we call our detective academy so that we can track them through their initial even two years so that when they are ready to come into crime, we're ready to accept them and ready to get them through those skills. 
Um, and so it's identifying that talent's key. And then we've just launched, which is an advert that's currently out and currently live, our, our accelerated programme for detectives, which is out now as an advert live on our website to hope that we can bring people in to do an accelerated route into the, to detectives. Did you want me to pause now for a question or? If that's um, OK, just before we move course. on to timeliness. Yeah, um, of course. Uh, so a couple of a couple of questions, if I may. First of all, when you're talking about the new policy that you put in place, you said that you'd seen improvements in the way that um, crimes were allocated to officers and that that was having an impact on quality. Can I just talk about how you're assuring, ask about how you're assuring yourself on that front? Are you dip sampling? Or do you have data evidence? What What is it that's assuring you that that improvement is being made? Yeah, well, the, certainly the, the 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 list of the crimes that are required to be allocated in this way is on a SharePoint site. So it's visible to me and all the supervisors in the force. So every day I know how many is on that list. So I know if it's professional judgment, if we're, you know, on, on top of it, if you like. Mm -hmm. But uh, so as far as the numbers, I think there is a grip a lot across the whole of the supervisors in the force of knowing if we are on top of that. As far as the quality and and allocation, that is being done by our business insight team. So soon they will be able to tell us that yes, all the crimes were done. Were they done in in the you know the timeliness? And they'll be able to do all those checks. What was the quality like? Because the, the crimes are allocated in relation to threat, risk, and harm. You know, and was the rationale good or not? So all that's been um, done um, at the moment, and we'll have hopefully a report to share about that as well soon. Okay, oh that that would be good. And will that also cover the allocation in terms of the right type of officer with the right kind of skill set because you were talking about that as part of that policy as well yes it will yes so has it, has it been allocated number one has it been allocated in the time scales and has it been allocated um yes the right officer and what is the quality update in relation to sort of vulnerability and threat risk and harm of that decision okay. and in terms then of 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 what you're saying this you know you've your four step um guide to, to good investigations and and your templates and and so on and so forth that's I think that's 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 good to hear. It's good to know that we're getting everything in the background uh, kind of organisationally correct. What benefit are you seeing and what improvement are you seeing in the actual outcomes of investigations as a result of that? Because obviously we're still in a position where 66 percent of um, uh, crimes don't um, uh, identify a suspect. You know, th there may be a lot of factors for that, but are we seeing an improvement in the investigations themselves? Selves as a as a result of of these kinds of measures that are being put in place. I can't probably say at this early stage that those four steps have led to a direct you know increase in a, an outcome for a certain crime type. But all I do know is that that improves the quality. You know that their offices are having to put more rationale down. They're having more of a structure in relation to the crime investigation. It feels like they're more directed on it. And then the office manager that's giving them that um, direction, that extra. Um, you, you know, crime um, um, experience, if you like, on their crimes um, can only be helping, which over time then will, you know, upskill the officers on the front line from that resource. OK, thank you. Elliot, did you want to say something on that front? Uh, yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, just just really, really quickly, I think it's really important, actually, the work that Fran and the team and Leanne, et cetera, put in on this, I think has had a direct correlation to the improvements we've seen with our victim service assessment recently. So the good and favourable outcomes we've had from that um, has been around the work that's been put in around that four steps and those investigative templates, which I know Fran, Fran's talked about. I, I think that has, is starting to really reap that dividend because this is all about service to the victim as well. Um, and whilst crime, um, crime outcomes we will see improvements in because we will focus on through forced performance meetings, quarterly performance meetings too, getting this right right up front for the victim is absolutely our focus and and so I'm just wanted to put on record really the hard work that's gone into to getting us to that point. Thank, thanks Elliot and I, I guess aligned with that then if 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 that if you feeling that that improvement is being made it's fantastic it's being made for the the, the victim and it's great that we're getting things down properly do you feel that you're also moving in a direction where um, you would be able to prosecute more based on the evidence that you that you are now gathering as opposed to necessarily needing victim support um, so that you can take more evidence evidential prosecutions forward? I think I think our officers understand evidence led prosecutions. So if they have sufficient to go for an evidence led prosecution, I do think they are really tuned into that. 
Okay. Um, so and it's just making sure that, you know, every opportunity to do that, they continue to. But they are, you know, they, they understand what an evidence led prosecution is and, and how to get to that and uh, build that evidence in relation to that. But again, again, Tom, I think as Fran, the point Fran was making there around, um, uh, you know, I've just made around engagement with that victim and keeping the victim up, updated and informed hopefully prevents us from that victim attrition in the first place and having to go down that evidence led prosecution bit by making sure we're cocooning the victims with with the support they need as well so um it's it's not a um it's not silver bullet but it's really really started to pay dividends for us and build a, a really good foundation thank you and just covering the last couple of points, really, the timeliness, again, in the guidance, there are, you know, time scales of when an officer needs to update a crime, whether it be in relation to vulnerability at 10 days, um, no vulnerability 28 days. And there's also um, every rank does various reviews as well. So as part of the bail and the uh, release under investigation procedures, um, various uh, ranks at different stages do um, do reviews on crimes. So that includes me up to superintendent level doing a superintendent review on crimes uh, at different Different points at um, 6, 12, 18 months and what have you. So there is a lot of scrutiny of the crimes um, at different uh, supervisory levels. And, as, and the governance over that, um, um, uh, Mr Foskett mentioned about the governance of these sort of monthly performance meetings, which will look at, again, the success um, or the compliance in relation to the investigation and allocation policy overall. But then, you know, getting down to sort of command level, there is dip sampling at command level by inspectors of PCs on their team of if they are complying with the four steps and various other things. But the four steps being one of them that's in their dip sampling and then down to individual levels of one to ones and discussing the importance of this uh, being key. So they were I think, the main points, unless there's, there's any questions on that at the moment for the investigations and the, the refresh. Fran, you mentioned dip sampling. How often does that happen? Uh, that's um, every, every month. There's um, a certain amount on every team um, that they, and it's the, um, they hold it on a, a spreadsheet and very, very things. Four steps is just one thing. They watch the body worn footage of crimes and they assure themselves that the victims um, have the best possible service. Um, and any feedback of any themes then come in and would then feed back into one of our other um, governance meetings if there was a, a wider theme to pick up. And does, does that cover the timeliness of updates? The four, well, yes, the four steps process is is those four things that I've mentioned, which is yeah. the have things been completed, outstanding, when when things been done, the timeliness and victim updates okay. as a whole. It, just from our, our perspective, obviously, with um, the complaints and recognition team, um, the the uh, not the majority, but a, a, a significant proportion of of expressions of dissatisfaction are always about the timeliness of updates and and um, uh, of, of investigations and and um, yeah I think for us that's that's a little bit of a benchmark uh, um, around that so um, it, it's good to hear that that dip sampling is in place if what what can you talk talk us through a bit more about that the process around that so for the public's benefit, they understand what that means. So, if 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 a um, uh, a case is seems to be dragging, for example, what what actions are put in place to understand why and what is done then to to see whether it can be progressed at any greater rate. So I suppose, well, from, from, you know, the PC does the you know initial investigation, you know, they do the updates, whether that be 10 days, if, for example, if it was a, a matter of vulnerability. The supervisor also then, you know, um, puts their supervisor um, template on and puts their uh, um, update on. An inspector will review that crime as well, um, at, you know, depending if it's a vulnerability matter or not, the different time scales, they will look at it and then superintendents will. There's various issues. That the, the, so as long as they update the crime of the timeliness and what they are doing, about it if for example there is a queue because of um it's gone to forensics and the forensics will take you know x amount of time i would expect them to put that on the crime and explain to the victim the reasons it, the crime was being delayed um so um the oversight is to make sure that we're um, diligent and expeditious as, as officers but actually there will be things that do take more time because they're, they're out of the officer's hands if you like because of some forensic opportunities but again when the supervisor puts that on they're the ones that address that so as a superintendent, I would address those things. And if there was any timeliness issue, I would address that on the crime with their the rank down from me, if you like, and address that. Yeah. OK, so th there would then be feedback to to try and try and 
push that forwards if it didn't look like there was a good good reason for yeah absolutely if, if there if there is anything that i think is is um that needs picking up with a crime or is not expeditious i will pick that up and likewise the other ranks should of their you know pc sergeants etc if things aren't getting done and be quite visible about that on the crime as well and and good expectations then around the pub you know the victim being updated on on that and uh kept up to date about th those reasons absolutely that the victims yeah. updated and and um you know um seek the victim's views of when they want to be updated you know the, the guidance and the policy says a certain amount of days but obviously the most important thing to be victim led of when they want to be updated okay all right thank you thank you and uh, i think it's over to where uh, uh john oh, no, sorry i did actually just want to ask on oh. um the the balance between released under investigation and pre-charge bail how are we doing with the kind of numbers of released under investigation these days. Now, Leanne may be able to help me on that one. <laughs> that might be... Yeah, yeah that might so, be more post towards Leanne. Yeah, no problem. Um, so at the moment, um, we've got 723 people on bail and we've got 2,495 people on released under investigation. So that is probably what we would expect. Um, Clearly, um, as Fran mentioned earlier, we've got uh, quite a robust uh, um, uh, offender management, if you like, uh, pre-charge bail, uh, release under investigation procedure, uh, which does follow the national um, guidelines uh, and in fact probably goes over and above that, um, where um, there are very particular staged pr um, parts of that process where there are a, a, a very um, reviews that are done at all different ranks as, as Fran said going up to superintendents so there is a quite a stringent monitoring process around that we do also have a dedicated um, uh, pre-charge bail and IUI sergeant who oversees uh, this data and um, that data actually is visible across the force on our dashboards so it is there and available for monitoring uh, for supervisory purposes okay. does that answer thank you yes okay. thank you and I are you seeing um a, sorry a, a separate question um as a result of all this are you seeing a reduction in victim attrition in the in victims dipping out of the uh, out of so the work that we've done um today on victim attrition around from the the police side of things mm -hmm. um uh, demonstrates and there's still some more work to do on it I'll be honest Tom in terms of some of the, de the detail but that demonstrates that um, around the majority of our victims do um, fall out of the system within the first three months yeah. so um, obviously with some of those investigations that are released under investigation go on for a lot longer because we might have direct forensic opportunities etc um, uh, that doesn't prove to be it doesn't seem to be a major factor um, in um, in attrition. Um, what's important is we manage those victim expectations, which obviously Fran's just mentioned in terms of the, those procedures that we've got that's written into our policies um, and that we uh, support our victims. Um, and uh, Mr Foskett mentioned obviously around our uh, VSA earlier um, where, you know, there are some very favourable outcomes that are coming from that. So, you know, there are very varied uh, varied and many reasons um, for victim attrition, as, as you'll probably know. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, but um, our, uh, if you like, we, we frame our policies and processes to make sure that the victim is at the forefront of that in all of them. So we can help pick up uh, those support processes and manage those expectations as we go along. So perhaps worth us dipping back and, and understanding in three or six months time whether the good results coming through on the uh, um, the VSA is, is actually resulting in a, in a reduction course. in those. Yeah, um, and we, we are doing uh, quite a bit of work around the, uh, the data around attrition, so I'm sure that will be a journey that we will continue to track, but right the way through the system as well. Yeah, so uh, including the criminal justice part of it. Well, it's, it's good to hear that those steps are being put in place right early on, because obviously if it is, so, you know, in the first three months, then then that's the important point at which we need to, to focus. So it's great that those yeah. steps are being put in place. Thank you. OK, shall I go on to the next slide for John now? OK. 
Thank you, Leanne. Okay, so it's moving on. Seem to be seem to be frozen for a moment. There we go. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Leanne. Uh, good afternoon, Commissioner. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I'm John Norton, Temporary Superintendent. Currently, um, one of my roles is being Head of the Digital Forensics Unit here at North Yorkshire Police. Um, got quite a bit to go through, um, and I think I'll just start by explaining what UCAS ISO 17025 accredited actually means. Um, UCAS is a United Kingdom accreditation service. It's a government appointed accreditation service for um, for, for for us and um, various other bodies, uh, ISO. That's the. I've got to read this because it's backwards. International Organisation for Standardisation, um, one seven zero two five. Basically, what that means, it's a, a laboratory standard accreditation that any work that's conducted in our DFU could be replicated in any other accredited lab anywhere in the world and come with the same result. Um, because of that, that that's where the integrity and the standard of the um, evidence that we provide is. To maintain that accreditation is no mean feat. Um, UCAS attend four yearly and do a very detailed deep dive inspection of all our processes, all our procedures uh, within the digital forensics unit. Um, we had that inspection last year. We were successful. Uh, there was an action plan that came out as a result of it that was demanding, but we've met that and we now maintain that uh, what I've called here a kite mark um, of, of assurance of standards. Um, they don't just do it every four years and walk away. Uh, they do come back and we're expecting them later on this year for what they call a surveillance visit, um, which is not as uh, in, not as detailed as the, the, the four yearly one, but makes sure that uh, we are maintaining the standards uh, which we've uh, shown to, to obtain that, that accreditation. Um, and as I say, because of that, that means that the um, the evidence that's coming out of DFU back to the investigators through the criminal justice system and into a court will withstand scrutiny and, and that's the standard of evidence that we want uh, and also it works with not against um, College of Police in um, authorised professional practice uh, which does exist for uh, digital evidence so the investigators will be following that and the work that we do within the uh, the DFU digital forensics unit will, will complement that uh, as we move on. Um, so if we move on to the, the team expertise and professionalism bit, I, I could talk about my teams all day long, Commissioner. Um, they're um, very highly trained, um, really committed people, um, and, and they're coming to work into what is a, a very demanding and challenging environment. Um, we train them up to industry standard. Um, as we sit here now, I've got 100% attendance across all of my functions, including digital forensics unit. Um, during the times of lockdown, the only place they can do this work is within the DFU laboratory. The people were coming in to continue to do the work. I can't speak highly enough of them. However, what comes with that is we train these people up very well um, and we are prey to industry. We are prey to academia and we do uh, lose people which we expect and we're going to, not going to be able to keep hold of these people forever but attrition of staff is, is an issue uh, and we've got plans in place to try and address that um, which I've shared with uh, Mr Foskett and with other in interested parties and we'll look to uh, implement a, a, a staff retention plan. Um, so uh, and again as it says at the bottom of that high, co high profile court results any court result will have some digital forensic element to it, uh, but it's really pleasing to get some um, messages from uh, some of our senior officers who've been at Crown Court and are getting some significant convictions uh, against some um, high risk uh, individuals and it is a result of the evidence of uh, our, our digital forensics unit. So as I say, moving on to the demand side of it, I, I can't think of any crime type where you're not going to have a, a digital forensic element to it. Um, and that growth in demand, along with the proliferation of smart devices in the house or elsewhere, um, mobile phones, storage capacity doubles every 18 months. So all, all these things are adding to the, op the digital forensic opportunities that are available to investigators, but also adds to the demand of what we get coming through um, our DFU. So if we look at demand at the moment, we're around about 500 cases live within DFU, of which about 350 of those are awaiting allocation. That's not 350 devices to examine. That's 350 cases, each of which has multiple um, 
devices or exhibits to it. So we're around to go through um, the laboratory here. So um, in, in respect of that, what, what do we look to do with regards to managing that, that demand? Um, we have to maintain that accreditation. We have to maintain the processes that we go through and we have to follow quite rigorous procedures in how we get the evidence. But what we need to look at is maintaining the resource to deal with it and tackling the demand. Now, whether that's tackling the demand at source um, and looking at places while still being very much victim focused, do we need to seize everything? Do we need to submit everything? Uh, and if we can be a bit more um, savvy when we are at scene, just about what we are getting some subject matter expert advice, uh, doing some triage at scenes of crime to identify which is the, the best exhibits to bring in. We can do that. We're developing a, a lab triage process, which will again put another filter through to make sure that the correct devices are going through the, the, the DFU um, processes. And also there's a, a real um, decision put on the inspectors because there is an authorization process for devices to come through to us and that sits with the inspector and the inspectors are sometimes going to have to make some tough decisions because um, in much the same way that uh, Tommy you're asking about the dip sampling um, of um, other elements of it I dip sample um, authorities and authorizations for devices that come into the DFU and every one of them on their own stands up to scrutiny because every one of them will be victim focused, will meet the criteria and it will appear to be a reasonable and proportionate line of inquiry for that investigation. However, if you look broader and you look at the other competing demands and the other risks that are coming into DFU, they're going to have to ask some questions about whether this is the right way to go about dealing with this particular investigation, this particular individual, and there may be alternatives for for lower charges that end up with disruption and intervention opportunities. But in a lot of cases, things are going to come through to us and, and we accept that. So um, just to give an indication, approximately 25% of all our demand is in relation to online abuse team um, and indecent images. That has to come through the DFU. There's, 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 no, there's nowhere else for that to sit. But we do have other options available to us, uh, which include, I'm probably moving on to stuff that's on the, the, the next slide now, Leanne Rayla. Um, but we do have stuff that, that, that's coming through to us and options that are available um, that will take us uh, out to the scene to, to do the same standard of digital forensics work, but not within that, that UCAS accredited environment and provide um, the evidence and the exhibits um, to, to the investigators. Um, and, and, and also it's a quicker turnaround if we can do it at the scene and it keeps that, that victim on board. Um, I do realise I'm completely jumping around what you've got here in front of you and I hope that's fine, Commissioner. Um, but th there's, there's so much that we've got going on here. Um, John, so, can I just, just, just quickly, just so that we get some context to this and, and it's a bit easier. Um, could you just, you say you've got about 1,600 1700 devices at any time um, to to look at on average how long might it take you to look at a device well if, if i come to cases we get we get through about 50 cases a month okay so i, I would say that probably equates to and it is, it's just quick quick finger in the air maths so i'm about 200 but there, there, there are devices and there are challenging devices. Uh, some of these need some some real complex work doing on them where, where we um, have, have to do some very technical, I mean, it's all technical, but some very technical stuff to, to te take devices apart uh, to get into them to, to do the examination. So where you might get something that's quite straightforward. So if we have uh, you, you know, a straightforward device with consent from a victim or a witness, for a case that will be a lot easier to, to, to get into and extract the evidence that we require. There are others that is far more complicated and, and, and more difficult than that. To support that, we've got a case management system in place that was launched earlier on this year, uh, in February, I believe it was. Um, and, and as that develops and with the support of Business Insight, we'll be, get, be able to get a bit more sophisticated about assessing that demand, assessing where um, where we can make further improvements and seeing what the challenges are and, and that will support us through um, both quality performance meetings and, and, and the various other places where I'm held to account for, for the, uh, the delivery of DFU. 
They're just um, when we get to the top there, it, it says uh, mobile digital forensic platform. Mm. I'd just like to chat about that for a minute if I can. Um, Commissioner, you remember earlier on this year, you were kind enough to come to uh, headquarters and have a look around our van. You asked me a technical question that I couldn't answer. So I pointed <laughs> towards somebody else. Um, some time ago last year, uh, North Yorkshire Police were successful in bidding to uh, the Forensic Capability Network um, for some uh, hardware in support of um, tackling rape and serious sexual assault. Um, we got the equivalent of about 130 to £140,000 worth of hardware uh, that you sat in and you've seen. Yes. Um, and, and this is street triage and scene examination. And, and this is where we can primarily, it is there for rape and serious sexual offence victims. Um, we can, with um, in speaking to the investigator, we can arrange to get to a victim in a discreet vehicle and we can conduct forensic examinations of the victim's device and give it back to him in a matter of hours, not days and not weeks, and certainly not months. This has put us in a really strong position because next April, um, what's called ADR 722, which is some data requirements that the Home Office require. Uh, and this is to support the uh, the Home Office pledge to victims that no adult victim of rape will be left without a mobile device for more than 24 hours without being offered a replacement. We're there already and we're doing that now. And we've got the measures in place, uh, we've got the kit in place, we've got the replacement devices in place and we've got the processes and procedures in place and we are doing it. The, the examples I can give you are anecdotal because it's so recent that we started it. We don't have sufficient data to be able to accurately present it to, to, to show um, uh, any, any more detail than that. But it will come. There's no doubt about it. But I'm really confident about our support to adult rape victims um, from North Yorkshire Police Digital Forensics Unit. Um, some of the demand management work here that we've got going on. Um, we, we've talked about the backlog that we've got. Um, and alongside that backlog, we've got a service level agreement and we're not making it as often as I'd like to. Uh, and even if we are making it, it's not a service level agreement I'm particularly proud of. Uh, and I would like those turnaround time dates to be lower than they are, um, really. Um, we shouldn't be waiting as long as we are to get these um, this evidence back to the investigators. Um, so there is an action plan in place. Sorry, John, what, what are you talking about at the moment? What, you know, what's your kind of type? Right, I was I was expecting that question. <laughs> but, uh, the um, and the, the the longest that we've had that's been submitted to, to digital forensics for examination goes back to last May. Now we've got to look at public interest. Sorry, May twenty one. May twenty one. Yes, apologies. We have to look at the public interest uh, in, in these cases and the risk associated with them. What I'm really reassured about is that we are attributing the right level of risk to all these cases that come through into DFU. Um, that case in particular, it is in the public interest, but it's low risk uh, and it will get there eventually. And I, I've been told that that will be resolved in the next two weeks, not as a result of coming to this meeting, it's just after where it sits in the queue. So they are, they are being addressed, but there are some that are two, three hundred days, Tom, and I, I, I don't like that. I don't like that at all. So what are we doing to address it? And, and that is where um, the, the action plan that we've got in place to tackle the backlog is there's, there's a, a number of different streams to it, which include a lot of the stuff that I've covered already, dealing with things at the scene, educating um, inspectors to, to review what they're authorising, some more efficient processes within the department as well. And um, thanks to the significant uplift that we got um, last year, uh, better resourcing of, of people in the department. We're going through a recruitment process at, at the moment and we are getting people in and then alongside to complement that, um, that look, look at um, trying to stop people leaving, that retention plan as well. Um, so, so that kind of covers a, a lot of what we've got in acknowledging the demand, acknowledging that we've got a service level agreement that I'm, I'm not happy with but we've got plans in place to address it uh, and, and finally some of the technical solutions this is it's a worldwide global industry is digital forensics uh, we work with um, companies um, all across the globe um, and we do use and exploit state-of-the-art cutting-edge digital forensic technology 
uh, within North Yorkshire Police, and we continue to do that. Um, we're always linking in with, I've already mentioned, the, the Forensic Capabilities Network, uh, local and regional forums as well, um, and, and those people in the public and uh, private sector uh, that will provide those um, tools for us. Happy to take any questions from anybody. I feel like I rattled through that a little bit. I guess, oh, sorry, go on, sorry. Well, no, 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 Tom, please, you go. I, I was I was just going to ask when, John, when, when do you think you might, what's your action plan timeline? Right, well, we've got, as I said, we, we've, if, if we were to get to um, a full cohort of digital forensic examiners, um, we, as I said, we've got interviews taking place in the next couple of weeks, that puts us in a place where we've got the resources that, um, business insight, demand analysis told us that we need to meet the SLA. So when we're there, that means that we can start looking to tackle this backlog. Once we get to a position where we are, I think we're talking 12 months, if, if, if I'm honest. Um, once we get to a position where we are meeting that SLA, I will be commissioning business insight to come back in and do further demand analysis with a look to making sure that we're exploiting the resources that we've got to the best of our ability. And if that is the case, and we're still looking to improve that SLA, we we'll look for further uplift. But before I can do that, I need to satisfy the Chief, yourself, Commissioner, that we're doing the best with the resources that we've got. Thanks. I don't think there's any further questions on, on this particular slide. Thanks very much, John. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So it comes across to me now, Commissioner. I don't think I introduced myself, obviously, to those um, online. Uh, so I'm head of uh, criminal justice, Liam McConnell, at, uh, at obviously North Yorkshire Police. Um, so I, the next couple of slides, I just want to um, explain, um, if you like, the, the passage of uh, the product of investigations and the cases going through um, to the end um, in terms of the criminal justice process or, or another um, criminal justice disposal outcome. So you, you'll, if it's all right, it's going to be a little bit um, um, of input to, put to, to start off with to help explain some of that because it's quite complex. Um, I'm not going to, you'll probably be relieved to hear, explain all of these boxes on this slide here. Okay, so, um, but I just wanted to uh, put them up to illustrate, um, you know, the different types of, or well, the many different types of disposal routes and options an investigation can take um, or uh, the conclusion of an investigation. So, so for each each one of these different disposals as well, there is a you know that there are different rules and requirements that are all framed by different legislation and different national uh, guidance that, that can can range from no further action right the way up through to charge, but also a whole uh, range of out of court disposals, um, which are still potentially. Um, you know, uh, either a, um, diversionary um, options and pathways, but also other formal um, criminal justice disposals. Now, um, each one of these boxes on this slide will direct an investigator, if you like, um, as to what particular action they need to take um, and how to progress their case to a conclusion. So, um, and those um, different disposal outcomes will then trigger actions from different parts of either North Yorkshire Police or, uh, you know, guided by our, our local uh, policy and procedure um, and um, or other parts of our operational um, support teams, such as those within the criminal justice teams. Um, and it will also, depending on the route and the pathway, engage um, uh, other uh, key stakeholders such as criminal justice partners, so i.e. The, the, the Crown Prosecution Service or the court service or other partners um, who work together with us um, around that efficient and effective um, uh, case progression route. Um, so we don't have time to go into all of these. I'm not going to go into all of them. As I said, I know earlier in the year you did have a comprehensive um, PAM um, on the out of court disposals. So I'm sure if, if people want to look back at some of that detail, that it, it's it's clearly on your website, Commissioner. Um, but I, I just want to um, focus on those crime cases um, uh, that go into the court arena in terms of the the case progression. Um, I won't touch upon those that potentially go into the court arena as a result of 
um, a, a single justice procedure route or specified cases, which is where the police um, process and prosecute directly, um, uh, because that's probably a pan in itself. So I'm not going to touch on those either, unless you have any specific questions about that. But um, so the focus around the crime cases and the next few slides concern um, the, the principal public prosecuting body being the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, but in order um, to sort of understand which route uh, an officer has to think about um, when they sub submit a, a, a case file, um, I just probably it would be helpful probably to just outline um, the category of criminal offences. Um, so just bear with me um, if, if that's OK. Um, so the um there are, there are three main categories for criminal offences if you like um uh, all, all of them start off um uh, in in the um the uh, magistrates court um and then they flow from there so there are summary only offences which can only be heard um in the magistrates court which is the lower court um and um the uh if, if essentially these these cases um, though it can't be heard, you, you don't have a, uh, if you like, a, a jury uh, listening um, to the uh, to the case or the, the facts of the case. Um, uh, and there is a, a maximum sentence um, in the magistrate's court um, for summary offences, which is six months. But but just recently, for uh, an either way offence, which I'll come into in a minute, there's a maximum sentence there for a single either way offence of twelve months now, um, which was put in place to help um, tackle some of the, the backlogs. Um, uh, caused by the pandemic and, and the general criminal justice system. So then moving on, we do then have indictable only offences um, and they are the most serious offences, such as, you, you, you know, you rape, you, you, you murder, you robbery, they can only be heard in the Crown Court. Um, and then there are the either way offences, which I just mentioned, which can be heard in either uh, court, depending on sort of mid-level offences, depending on whether um, a, a, a defendant um, wants to elect trial by jury in the Crown Court or the court considers that it's so serious that it needs to be dealt with in the Crown Court because the Magistrates Court doesn't um, provide sufficient sentencing power should somebody be found guilty. OK, so so having having outlined those types of offences, um, it's probably easier to then explain how then decisions are made in, in terms of um, an, an, a charging offence to court. So, so all police forces in England and Wales have to follow guidance set down under the uh, Director of Public Prosecutions um, uh, charging guidance. Um, I think we're currently in the we're currently in the sixth edition, which was issued in December 2020. So that's um, probably unsurprisingly known as the Director's Guidance Six Edition or DG Six for short. Um, and the police must follow those guidelines. Otherwise, we'd, we'd, we'd face potential uh, legal challenge as to the legitimacy of the charge. Um, uh, and if, if, if members of the public do want more information about that, the CPS website is a good source to explain and go into detail about that. But, but the DG6 outlines a division of decision making responsibility um, for those criminal offences between the police and the Crown Prosecution Service. Um, and um, and also um, an officer has to consider um, whether a suspect during their investigation admits an offence or denies it. Um, and, uh, and clearly, in, in addition to whether there's enough evidence to submit um, a case in the first place. And they're all key considerations for the investigator in deciding how and where to send a case file or, or route a case file to. So. Um, so just to explain briefly the division uh, of charging responsibility. So the police may charge offences um, without prior referral to the CPS for any summary offence um, only, irrespective of the plea. Um, they may charge also any offence of retail theft or shoplifting or attempted retail theft, irrespective of the plea, provided it is suitable for sentence in the magistrate's court and also any either way offence anticipated as a guilty plea 
suitable for sentence in the magistrate's court. There are some exceptions to that, which makes it a little bit more complicated, you know, in terms of domestic abuse or hate crime, terrorism type and other a few other offences that do have to go to the CPS. But otherwise, the CPS prosecutor um, will make charging decisions in all the other cases that are not allocated to the police. And so that that in terms of numbers, that works out to be um, uh, roughly 70, 75 percent of cases that are coming through the criminal justice process are able to be charged directly by the police. And the other 20, 20, you know, 25, um, 30 percent have to go through the CPS. So I just thought that it was quite it's quite useful to probably just illustrate that um, because there's quite a lot of there to, for a, if you like, an investigator to consider um in in terms of you know um and that just is the one route uh, in relation to child so um i will go on to the next slide unless anybody's got any particular questions around that point well Leanne, on that front I'll, I'll um are we are our investigators making those decisions correctly are we seeing that kind of proportion and are we seeing those decisions being made robustly and in a timely manner so that those police charges are progressing at, at pace? I, I appreciate we then get into the whole courts backlog and, and, and everything along that front. But in terms of what NYP can do to make sure those cases are progressing as best they can, are, are you seeing that those decisions being taken? So uh, we, we need to come in probably onto the next slide, um, which will help um, to sort of explain some of the um, operational support functions that we have in place that helps to monitor and track and, if you like, brigade some of that work. Um, so if, if I may, Tom, if it's all right, if I go onto that slide and outline that, it might answer some of your questions. Um, we might need to come back to it, but if that's all right. Okay, that's fine. Okay, so... Um, OK, so um, so this 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 basically um, this slide represents, if you like, um, what I probably would call like the criminal justice sort of engine room. Um, and that obviously supports the case progression um, and the the, the, the blue and grey cogs um, on the slide do represent um, existing teams um, that do act as that, if you like, that central conduit between the frontline um, officer, the criminal justice partners, um, and, and they um, undertake, and we'll come into a little bit more detail around the teams in a minute, but they undertake a wide variety of tasks, including um, gatekeeping, advising the frontline um, in terms of the case files, um, liaising with the, the CPS uh, around um, action plans or, or, or um, the courts around listing matters, you know, they will, if you like, task and coordinate work going to and from the officer um, and, and to the agencies and or from other external parties um, at, uh, for matters that all contribute to an effective case uh, file, if you like, and therefore an effective case progression. Um, so essentially at the moment, um, where um, those cases where the police have the, if you like, the, the, the charging responsibility around decision making, um, the investigating officer will, will directly charge a suspect to court uh, and the method of charging can vary as well. So that can be done through our, uh, through a postal charge or through our prosecution team. Um, if we work sort of from the, the left, the, the right of the, the screen to, to the left, um uh, and um or through our custody suite so there are a number of different ways of um progressing um a charge matter um uh, and again linking back in which kind of touches upon the question you've just asked um around the bail and iui um so uh, obviously all the, the bail uh, cases do come back in through a particular route in a very timed fashion um uh, and and so therefore you know charges um, a, a, a around that, um, you know, uh, follow quite a strict um, regime. Once, obviously, um, the investigation is uh, is, um, is is underway, um, and then there are those um, points where we um, certainly 
uh, follow up on the those cases released under investigation um, uh, in terms of through to the final outcome of whether that's a charge or NFA or an out-of-court disposal. So there are those checkpoints in place, ensuring those, if you like, that timeliness before it gets to us. And then when it gets to, to, to us, we then use our systems to have um, that tasking and coordinating uh, process and tracking uh, process because there are um, uh, a plethora of requirements around the processing of cases um, which are framed around um, criminal procedure rules and, and other local agreements and SLAs that we have in place um, with, uh, with our partners um, around um, the uh, the timeliness and progression of cases basically and the standard of cases so our teams here will if you like um they're the guardians of that and they um will um guide officers or um request um uh work and and chase it up and task you know so that that is their function basically um so so they will also digitally process uh, case files uh, through our um, uh, um, two-way interface, our secure interface uh, across to the CPS, um, uh, and um, it's, it's sort of um, quite a complex process. But it, but it, what it does is it manages to leave our niche case system um, and go across to the it populates. Uh, the our partners case systems so the CPS system and across with the courts as necessary so there is that coordination if, if a case comes in for example and it's a, a remand case or a charge that will come in um, uh, overnight and then the, by the following morning um, you know the the charges are, uh, are with the courts on their system uh, the, the 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 threshold case or the skeleton file or the abbreviated file is with the CPS because at that point on a remand case that's the only information that we would have. And then from there, there are um, quite tight timescales by which an officer then has to complete or finish, if you like, um, an investigation and get their paperwork in. So there, depending on the type of case that there is um, uh, and, and the type of um, offence and also the court it's going to, um, uh, at that point, once the case has been charged, it's very regulated. Um, so there's there's very little room for manoeuvre um, in relation to those types of cases. OK, so um, and actually the, the life cycle of that case can also change as well, depending on um, what happens um, to, you know, circumstances that might alter a plea, for example, if, if we've anticipated a guilty plea um, and it goes through to a first court hearing and it pleads guilty, uh, that then it, then it's dealt with um, more or less it goes off a sentence but otherwise if it if if the plea then changes or it it starts off as a an, a not guilty case then that triggers off a different set of circumstances in terms of how an officer has to build a case file so all all of that is tracked and monitored and processed and tasked out through these teams um, but actually it brings me on probably to the so the middle big T a big um, cog which is the blue dark blue cog if you like um uh, which is entitled sort of um that and um, uh, the case quality review team and also the dedicated um uh, rasso case quality review team so for some for some times where where the cps um have the responsibility um around decision making and charges um uh, the, pol the, poli the police will have to will have to send uh, what's called a pre-charge uh, advice file um, across to the CPS um, so they can assess the case in line with um, their code. They have their own codes for chief crown prosecutors um, and um, they will then advise on a charge or a different outcome route um, before ref referring it back uh, to the police for action um uh, which is then triggers off the subsequent charge into court where appropriate so um uh it, if you like it, in order to pr provide at that stage and, and these are our these the cases that go to cps for, for pre-charge advice are our most serious cases um uh, and and in order sort of you know, if you like to provide that oversight and additional focus um 
in 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 our highest priority areas essentially you know such as obviously sexual offences um you know um uh, linking in clearly with our fourth strategy but also the vorg um strategy um in in in, in you know uh, we've seen that it's important that we've realigned resources to have a dedicated rasso uh if you like a small um, team, uh, but um, of experience um, and highly thought of um, detectives that that work to, to national, if you like, identify best practice a model. Um, but they work as a small team closely, um, if you like, alongside virtually the the, the CPS's um, RASO unit. I should explain RASO is rape and serious sexual offences. So um, there are a number of different types of of, of offences that that team will look at. But they are specialists in their area. They're subject matter experts, um, and they do work alongside um, uh, the investigating officers and advise and guide um, um, on the, what are, you know, often particular or specialist requirements for these types of cases compared to some other types of cases that we would process. Um, and um, uh, they they are also. Um, uh, experts in um, disclosure, which is a heavy part of um, the process around RASO type cases, um, and that's criminal disclosure, which is quite a complex area of legislation that changed um, in in December um, 2020, um, which I'll probably come on to in a little bit. But, but they will oversee and they will authorise um, cases going to the CPS um, but only if they meet a particular standard. If they don't meet that particular standard, they'll be they'll be going back to the officer for any remedial action for advice and guidance, uh, and they'll work with that officer to get that um, case into into a state where we're, we're we're content that it's ready to go to CPS for advice. Um, it's it's highly um, valued by the CPS. Um, they've been exceptionally um, complimentary about. The relationships and and the the work that's being done there, um, and I, I think our outcomes uh, around um, the cases that go to charge or that get to court um, in in this category um, is is exceptionally good. So I give you for an example, our uh, Rasso rape conviction rate our, um, is is well above the national average. So we're currently the latest figures. We're currently fourth in the country. Um, around that and we we hover around you know that part of the you know we've been first quite quite often do you know what I mean so at the top end um so that our um uh, over 12 month our average conviction rate uh is just under 80 percent 79.9 percent and for but for July it was 83.3 percent um and the national average is 68.7 so that probably just gives you a bit of an illustration around good work that's obviously coming out of that team and they are quite robust in their gatekeeping of those cases that will go forward to the CPS um but um and you know and they will um participate um in a whole range of other governance processes and development activities which is on the next slide and that also um you might be interested in um, in terms of things like scrutiny panels and that type of thing but um so 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 that that is a team that is an arm, if you like, or a branch of the bigger case quality review team, which is a newer team. So the master team has been in place for um, for a while, a couple of years, and obviously because of building on that success, because it, it does take some time around changing some of the culture and the the understanding around 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 it, but also um, the changes in legislation uh, and, and processes are. Uh, uh, really frequent it's, it's quite challenging for you know the, the wider workforce if you like to keep up with it so you know they are subject matter experts to keep on top of that but building on that um we wanted to sort of replicate that really um with a what with a bigger team for all other offenses um uh, and also um because of a, of a requirement around um supporting the um the interface that I mentioned earlier around the, the, the TWIF, it's called the two-way interface with the CPS. Um, and so the offer around the, the non-RASO cases, if that's what we'd like to call them, um, are um, is it's, a, it's an increased offer. It's a 
support to the front line. Um, and they will undertake very similar functions, but for non rasa cases. So they will um, they will provide um, that overnight support uh, for remand cases and digitally process those cases to court within the time frames that's required. Um, they will provide that central um, uh, point of advice and guidance for officers around what what they you know what what's required to be put on a case file of a particular type. Of the different types of case files in order to make sure that it um, is of a sufficient quality that CPS will accept it to advise on it um because there there are different types of triages that that they have to go through um in order to satisfy that so so that's only that's been in place since November 2021 um and um you know they themselves you know very fairly young team are obviously learning um but have started to make some um good good progress now getting into their stride um uh, and uh, and and you'll see probably on the on the next slide um just a little bit of performance in that area that bearing in mind it's it will probably take long it take it will take longer as well because they're much more a vast quantity of everything else other than the Rasso cases. So in order to, and they're dealing with a much wider part of the organisation um, in terms of knowledge uh, and skills um, in, in, in order to bring them, if you like, coach them up to the speed that, that, we, that we need them to be in terms of our case file quality. So those, those teams um, have very close liaison, obviously, with officers and they go out and work with the teams and sit with investigation hubs and with with officers. So and they have those their central point of contact for CPS and they have that, if you like, good um, relationship with the CPS. You know, uh, and sort of you know working both ways back to the front line, back to the CPS. So um, so that's something that um, we're quite uh, proud of. Clearly, there are some still you know developments around that um, at that area, but it's going it's certainly in the uh, in in the right direction. Um, yeah, and can I just yeah. ask on on the RASO? So so it's great to hear that the conviction rate is is really positive. Obviously, the um, the number that actually get to court in the first place is is still low. Um, what how is this helping to make sure that we get better charging outcomes in in rape cases as well is are we seeing a positive impact on the actual investigations as well is that feeding back down the line fran to into the actual investigation process as well in terms of what's producing those results and and therefore are we seeing our charge rate start to increase as well well, I'm the rape lead for the force now, so we have put some certain things in place that perhaps we weren't um, pushing as much before. And that's things like early investigative advice in relation to rape. So perhaps we weren't having that early interaction with CPS previously. And now our officers understand sort of when to approach. Um, and I, I think uh, um, having a better relationship with the CPS at an early stage to get some, again, direction on the investigations. Um, and it, it, then if we can get a positive outcome, we know probably an earlier early earlier stage there and there's various um, other things that I'm doing in relation to rape as well just another thing for example our front line we're introducing what we call um, the, the solo officer which is training for the front line office response officers so that they gave the very best um, experience to the victim and again also to collect the best evidence as well so that we do have a greater opportunity for a, for a better outcome so there's all sorts of things uh, that I now have um, in relation to rape investigation. And, and and any and any learning that comes out of um, the work that they're doing gets fed into Fran's um, governance process around the crime management um, side of things. But also, we feed things into um, uh, into training. We actually go and contribute to training days. Um, you know, so it's very much about that that 360 learning really. Um, and and obviously that work you know um, uh, with with the CPS um, really helps with that. Uh, and in fact, they've come along and they've they've given um, you know training inputs on various things. You know, disclosure is is a classic example. Um, so so that um, yeah, it, it's a it's a continual loop really um, around that. I mean, we have to work. Um, we we worked. We've got SLAs between ourselves and CPS. So the, the CPS have twenty eight days to turn around an advice file. You know that type of thing. Um, uh, so you know all of that's tracked through um, as well. 
um, and 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 those that are, that are reported on um, in terms of performance as well. Um, and uh, we have a a case progression, a dedicated sort of case progression uh, framework, um, which I'll come on to in a minute around um, how we monitor and track um, those cases as well. Leanne, can I yeah. just interject? Yeah. We're running quite over yeah. time, Fine. actually. That's so right. would you mind if we go on yeah. to the next slide? Yeah, I can. If I, if I can just quickly mention this, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a potential opportunity, which, it, which obviously I'll take the time off at the end, but um, it's something that um, I'm quite excited about. Um, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but it, it proposes um, a significant um, support for frontline um, it, uh, and um, in terms of uh, uh, particularly tackling some of the challenges around uh, the new legislation in the disclosure um, arena and in redactions. Um, so it's a proposal that hasn't been through the governance process yet, um, uh, but it will do shortly. Um, but it is quite uh, quite a compelling business case and I think will bring quite a lot of um, uh, additional benefits and, and better outcomes for victims uh, but uh, that's probably to be continued if you like so um, okay so the, this slide really just touches upon everything I've just been saying and you can see the increase there and the difference that the um, case quality review team the non rasso team are, are making um, a difference we, we've got visible dashboards that's there from a performance perspective that's available to the force to look at and you'll see just on the left hand side there some of the key uh, file quality challenges that not just unique to um, uh, uh, MYP but nationally actually so I mentioned pre frequent change in legislation there there is the challenge around the DG6 which is disclosure um, and there's some details there around a national federation survey on detectives which are quite stark and is quite um, uh, good for people to to have a look at and that's not dissimilar to um, uh, what our staff are saying to us um, in terms of the impact, which leads into the, the previous opportunity that I've just mentioned. But again, continual dig digital advancements, that's all over the criminal justice um, and, and well, the whole uh, policing arena, really, um, in terms of challenges for us. Um, and we do have quite an inexperienced workforce, and there are some details there, um, which um, obviously uh, lead us to keeping up those challenges around understanding the uh, requirements if you like for investigations and case file quality so i'll skip across that if that's all right go on to the next slide um so the next slide really this just shows you um that we do have um quite a, a, a you know a good framework around that partnership work and accountability um uh, so we have that national case progression framework that i mentioned earlier which does specifically go into um uh uh, uh, you know, um, case progression uh, jointly between ourselves and the CPS, and that's done at an operational improvement level, but also a strategic level, um, which is chief officer level. So there's quite a lot of additional scrutiny in case progression that there, that there wasn't previously, probably, um, under a different framework that was it was brought in re refreshed um, under the the new um, when the new DG um, guidelines came out, and there are um, a range of uh, performance stats that we work to in relation to that. And, you know, you'll see on here, there are at least four, um, if you like, scrutiny or partnership meetings, which are around RASO uh, or, in, or rape cases. Um, so that just shows you the level of importance that we all see um, in relation to this area of work. And then uh, disclosure um, and local criminal justice partnership meetings and other meetings, all in in feeding into various force frame frame for performance frameworks that we just talked about and then on the right hand side there we've got um new national um they're called criminal justice data dashboards now but they are the national scorecards um quite a complex set of metrics but um but public um in the public domain um that I know we're we're talking about on fr and Friday at the local community board that you chair commissioner so um um, again, it's being developed. There's a new um, case file quality metric that was introduced in August. It's still developing. Um, we we kind of sit almost bang smack in the middle, really, but actually just slightly above 
the uh, the national average around one of the metrics there around the case file quality that's been published, which you can see on the slide. Obviously, more work for us to do um, around that. So I don't, I wasn't really going to say anything else on that other than unless you have any questions around that particular slide. Okay. No, I don't think so. Tom, do you have any? No. Okay. Okay. Just, just by way of reassurance, either myself or Fran, um, either attend all of these or chair some of them. Right. So, you know, there is that sort of continuity um, at that level. OK, so um, final slide is probably for all of us, really. Um, you've heard about a number of the challenges as we've gone through. Um, uh, the, the couple of challenges that aren't that we didn't mention um, sort of at the moment that, that are quite key around our case progression um, is, is the bar strike um, uh, that uh, is indefinite and that there are uh, various national um, meetings that I'm attending around that uh, from MPC pers perspective and also um, keeping an eye on some cases that are going through the appeal courts at the moment in relation to that. Um, so that's quite an interesting um, position um, that we're all um, keeping a very close eye on and that's having impacts uh, clearly around victims and witnesses because cases are going off for quite some period of time um, on top of some of the pandemic recovery, which actually in North Yorkshire we're doing quite well with. But um, so, you know, there are the other um, challenges which we've already covered, really. So I won't probably um, cover those, but then a couple of a few opportunities there just to um, say that um, uh, we are I, I'm looking to um, bring in some additional analytical capability, which will help us with um, um, some of our obviously data and and trend analysis um but also um i think there is that case progression case which i've mentioned business case which is a good idea in my view um, and then also lots of technical technological investment which commissioner you've already approved and seen around the dems so that's quite exciting so that's going to help obviously the workforce we can think of in terms of efficiency but also outcomes we've, we've got other other digital um changes on the horizon there um and uh, legislative changes as ever um so uh, really um and, and um you know the, the degree holder entry program that fran is overseeing to increase some of our workforce there so um and all of these will lead to the better outcomes that i've listed on the left so i probably don't need to say anything more <laughs> <laughs> i think you need a glass of water now i can i really do okay. OK, um, I don't think there are any further questions. Thank you very much okay, for no that comprehensive report. So thank you to Fran, John and uh, Leanne. Thank you very much. So we'll go on to, mindful of time, uh, to Elliot, who's going to give us a performance update, please. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, I will try and hopefully share this with you. Um, please, can you shout up if you can see that? I'm hoping you can. Yes. Oh, well, yes, we can. Yeah. Great. Um, OK, so I will um, do a fairly whistle stop tour through this. I will canter through it with the time, but clearly just stop me if you um, if you do want to ask any questions on it. So um, so the first slide then is on our call volume and call answering times for emergency calls. You can see um, from our graph here that we've had that steady increase uh, actually from way back when in 2019. And I know that you've seen this plenty of times before. Um, so I won't I won't labour the point too much. We are seeing the average speed of answer um, starting to drop now, which is really good. The goal group is running regularly and the resources that are in there will remain in the control room until the end of October. The additional resources we put in during which time we are having new trainees coming in. New trainees are taking live calls as well on a mixture of shifts, clearly under under supervision. Um, but that's uh, that's having a big impact as well. And we're we're optimistic that that is moving in the right direction now. Um, finally, on that note, in relation to the emergency and actually um, the non-emergency call volume, which I'll come on to now, um, you can see there a slight increase this uh, this month in relation to the non-emergency ones. But I, I suspect that Commissioner, you're already aware of this, but this is about us focusing on those emergency call times more than anything else, really, because that's where our risk to the public really sits generally. Um, but but again, uh, just to let you know that there is a new um, management team in place, as you're aware, within the control room and a new performance framework 
um, has now been put in place there as well to monitor that. Um, so as we move out of the summer period, we do start to see generally a, a, a flattening of demand within the control room and it should start to drop a little bit. Um, he says touching wood and keeping fingers crossed because it is really important for us. But the nines continue to be where our focus lies. I'll pause there um, because those are the two around core handling. So I'll take any questions and answer as best I can. Tom, I, can't, to... I can't see any, so please shout up. Tom, um, do you want to come in on this? Oh, you're on mute. Uh, not particularly. I mean, it, it, I think it's it's a well-worn story now. It's it's um, yeah. you know, it's it's great to see that the nines are coming down. Um, uh, and of course, that always has to be balanced. And I know it's been an absolute record month in August, hasn't it? It has in terms of the triple nines coming in. So it, it's no surprise yeah. that 101 is 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 slightly behind the the curve um, in terms of the increased average uh, increase against the average. But um, yeah, obviously. I mean, Tom, to be honest, and everybody, I think I think had we seen the similar demands that we've seen previously and not such unprecedented demands, we'd have made even in greater inroads into it. So, uh, as I say, as we come into the, the the darker months, we tend to find that flattens out a little bit and hopefully we'll make even better inroads into that. Um, it is absolutely top of our agenda as a force, top priority. Um, our police and response. Um, I think last time uh, ACC Mike Walker provided a little bit of context around the P grade incidents um, and that attendance had risen for two months straight and was linked into some changes in, in the grading response. We're now starting to see some of the improvements there uh, and a levelling off um, in relation to that. Um, you can see down in the bottom here, the, the bit to look at is our immediate ones and um, officers that we, we tend to, um, the, the average amount of officers per incident. Um, and on our immediate ones, you can see um, clearly uh, ASB crime being the highest at 3.95. And then if you look down to the priority grades, there's quite a quite significant drop. So we are sending the resources we need to, to the immediate grades and to uh, uh, where they need to be um, when they're needed. So I'm, that's quite a reassuring for me. Um, and that is part of the ongoing goal group for the force control room and the local policing. Uh, come on, coming on to our crime. Um, it, it, interestingly, that it's still within. Uh, you can clearly see the dips that we we we've experienced here, um, uh, uh, and there's no no surprises why. And we had a, a rise as it got to the summer last year, and and you can see that cyclical sort of dip and rise, dip and rise as we move through the summer months. I guess one of the things to point out is that violence against the person really has risen steadily over the past three years. It sits at the top of the list here. Um, and actually, when you start to delve into that a little bit deeper, the largest sections, which is no surprise, are assault with and without injury. They've had the largest rises and account for that, that overall rise. Public order, um, again, has seen a, a, a bit of a rise in that time. But interestingly, um, you can see that fraud crimes have decreased um, actually proportionately of the total crime count. But that's because they've everything else has gone up. They've sort of remained steady. Um, conversely, I guess we'll come on to um, to burglary in a second, but burglary crimes appear to be decreasing over the last three years um, and the volume of burglary, residential burglary in particular, has gradually decreased, reaching a height of um, 236 in August 2019 and there were only 106 in, in August this year. And, and I think that's that's absolutely, you know, that, that is a couple of hundred fewer victims of burglary, um, which is which is fantastic to see. So um, we will, you know, we will keep our eye on that because as you can see from the next one, the next thing that we will be tackling and we're looking at through our neighbourhood crime um, and forced performance meeting is our burglary resolved outcome rate. Uh, and there was a spotlight on neighbourhood crime at forced performance last month. Um, uh, and the month before that was in relation to forensics and forensic opportunities. So we are um, really pushing uh, the resolution and detection of burglaries and, and burglary in particular. Robbery, um, I, I, you know, we've looked at the four year trend around it. Um, so not just what you can see there, we wanted to understand what that spike was um, there uh, and what the higher thing was actually. Um, when we looked at it, at that data, it actually sits in Harrogate um really um and scarborough and york based on the, the the address but there's nothing in there that we can say there was a pattern there was a trend there was a particular uh, offender or particular hotspots we just saw really an unexplained rise um it, it, so 
around that, I've recently commissioned a refreshed robbery and theft from person problem profile um, through, through our force tasking. Uh, you know, just to try and understand what our, I mean, it is also worth bearing in mind if you look at the numbers here um, along the left axis, they're very low. Um, so we are talking just a few crimes can make a massive difference in that and what looks like a spike. But actually our robberies um, across North Yorkshire, um, it, it still remains really, really low compared to very, many of the forces, uh, most of the forces, in fact. Violent crime I've already touched on. Um, we're starting to see that come down again now, and we'd, we'd hope to see that drop even further as we approach the winter months too. Vehicle crime looks like um, we've we've taken quite a um, a, a kind of a, a steep rise there of vehicle crime, um, but again, it's it's worth bearing in mind that it is it is still very low numbers, um, but it is something that's been looked at under local performance meetings and through neighbourhood crime, both at force performance and the strategic tasking and coordination group as well. And um, it, can yes, I just sorry. ask you a question on that? So do we know the cause for the increase then? Has anything um, been highlighted at all? No, and, and Commissioner, I have to say, because it because it wasn't sitting featuring on one of our priorities for quite a while, and nationally that's the case as well, it's not something we really looked into. What, what I have asked for, I haven't asked for a problem profile around vehicle crime yet, um, because the numbers are still within our upper and lower control limits. Um, but I have asked for a problem profile on burglary, which I think will be delivered next month. And then the, the month after that, going into November, we'll see the robbery and theft. If this still stays within that limit, I, I'm absolutely um, you know, happy to, to commission a problem profile just to understand it. Um, it is still historically low. Um, as I say, over the, over the four years, it is, it is pretty low, um, although it does look um, over the 12 months, it's not where we want it to be. So absolutely right. Um, OK, the next one is on uh, this is a we, we've visited this quite a few times, as you're aware, and we've we've had all sorts of what does this mean? What does that mean? Um, and for me, just to, to say that the crimes that are outstanding here that are awaiting outcome, um, there is a plan around that that does sit under ACC Walker and we have seen a, a plan to resolve that um, going forward. I think this one here, um, the one that says groups under awaiting it. We, we had some debate about this previously. What does it mean if it's an, an other incident or non-crime? And actually, finally, I think we got to the bottom of what that is now. And there is a, a huge amount, a, a, a thousand and something um, sitting within that, um, that are sitting with action fraud. So we book them on here. They then go over to action fraud for investigation. So that that accounts for a huge amount of them. But, you know, we, we've talked about prior uh, previously why it's important for us to get these updated so that we, we can show the outcome. One of the things we found recently through the force tasking process was that our um, some of our officers doing the right thing um, for the right reasons, as it were, haven't sent their crimes off for finalisation. They've, they've actually got to the final stage, but they keep them open because they're keeping them open to investigate them and put other stuff onto it post charge, for example. So we've now got onto that head of crime, Fran, who's, who's on, was, um, is, is all over that. And uh, that's, you know, we hopefully have an automatic fix for that. So that should start to improve too. Uh, coming on to the next one, section 136 then, 29 occurrences. The bit for me around this, um, again, we this this huge figure up here, the average minutes per occurrence, which equates to about 15 hours for, for every one of these. So it, it is quite a drain on officer times. And I think one of the things that is worth worth looking at in that is that around about 50 percent of our interventions, as you can see here, um, relied on police to transport um, the person in, um, which is not great. Um, we know that um, and work is ongoing with that. Uh, but then the other side of that, the flip side of it is 31% of our detentions resulted in admission. Um, so, so two thirds didn't. So again, we need to drill into that a little bit further to find, are we actually um, you know, uh, using the power when we don't need to? And this is coming to the use of powers board, which I'll come on to in a minute. Okay. Um, so that which which is this one. So forced legitimacy, stop and search. Um, you know, this this for me is now under our new use of powers and Tom and I are meeting, I think, following this meeting today to look at the scrutiny around that. So it, it's this looks it, it is stark. If you're Asian, you are three and a half times more likely to be searched and, ha and have an eight percent higher uh, action taken rate. 
Um, so whilst we've got good scrutiny in, in place and we've got that use of powers meeting, the use of powers meeting enables us to dig a lot deeper into that now. So an action from that meeting, for example, is to ensure that the intelligence that we've got doesn't become self-serving. So we then start looking for, we, we produce intelligence, we says we need to target here. We then stop and search more young black men, for example, which generates even more intelligence, which goes into the system, which then comes out about young black men in that area. So that's part of the action I've tasked um, under that group to review those stop searches to ensure that we are aligned where we are doing stop and search to our control strategy priorities and link to our priority on that. Um, the stop search leads also tasked a review of all stop and searches from the Craven and Skipton area. So they're going to be additional scrutiny on that. That will come back to the board. And then I've also um, I'm going to task out a separate piece of work around disproportionality. If I draw your attention to the bottom of the page, the final comment hypothesizes that the higher positive outcome rate supports the view that this is intelligence led. So I want to ensure that that's the case and that actually it's not disproportional, uh, disproportionality in how we apply the action. So are you more likely to have positive action taken against you, for example, if you are from a, a minority ethnic background? So if the former is the case, that will feed into my intelligence thing that I talked about. And if the latter is the case, we'll pick it up under that uh, use of powers meeting as we were with the other ones, such as body worn video, taser, use of force. Uh, and other coercive powers. Sorry, this is such a canter through, but I am aware of the time. Um, so I'll, I'll pause there for questions on those. OK. Yeah. Uh, so finally, positive to hear that oh, you're doing that work around that. that yeah, area, Tommy, it's really, really important. It, it, I think for me, there's, there's lots of meetings going on, lots of stuff being looked at, but having that force level oversight and governance to have that great, de great degree of scrutiny. And we'll, obviously we'll talk about the um, external scrutiny on that panel after this as well. So, yeah. um, so just coming on to workforce then, we know that our target FTE is 1645, um, and actually we're about to get to 1641 headcount with the September intake. So we are well on track. Our actual headcount um, by the end of the month with September as well, um, rather than FTE will be 1660. So we are where we, we need to be. So um, that's good news. And I'll come on to that in a second. Just touching on workforce diversity, that's not where we want it to be. We know that and we've talked about that recently around what we're doing and the action we've got. Um, you know, so what I have asked for as well, I know it's been called up upon before, is this bit at the bottom here to be split out into police officers and police staff as well. So that will that will come next time. But in the interim, I do have the figures which I'll quickly run through. So police officers in ethnicity, 2.6% um, are identified from a, an ethnic minority heritage with a further 1% not stated. For police staff, that drops to 1.6%. And uh, you may recall John McFall a couple of months ago said he believed that that would be the case and wanted that split out, which is why we've done it. Interestingly, though, with our specials, um, that's our most diverse mixture and 8.22% of our specials um, are identifies from a minority ethnic background, which is which is really interesting and something actually because of this, we've got our positive action team and our recruitment team talking to our specials um, to see whether they'd like to join us as well. You know, it, it, it really surprised me. A further nearly 3% of specials actually not stated as well. Gender wise, for police officers, it's a 37% versus 63% male. Um, that's roughly where the, the the line is nationally as well. So we're not out of kilter, but again, with 50% of the population being women, we, that's not where we'd wanna be. Police staff, 62% women and 38% men. And specials is our lowest actually, 30% um, women and 70% men. Uh, so I'll pause, I know that was a whistle stop tour of that. Is there any questions on that one? I don't think so. Okay. Um, workforce again then, so really quickly, the campaign for new applicants is still live, closes on the 30th and we've got a number of applicants progressing um, and a further intake planned in January. Um, that's for police officers, uh, PCSOs, which is on the next slide. You can see we are we are going to achieve our other target. PCSOs, again, still not where we want to be on that. Our next intake starts this month. Uh, and the campaign for new applicants is still live, closed on the 30th of September. So, and we've got a number of applicants already in that, progressing through the assessment process. A further intake planned on 20, uh, 2023, um, uh, January 23. So we hopefully start to see those um, come up. Um, I think the other thing I'd like to, I know it's been touched around the DHEP programme. 
we've got a new positive action team in, in place, as you're aware, Commissioner. And yesterday they went to a careers fair where they mix with a really diverse mix of people. So they're not saying it's definitely because of them. But overnight, we had 18 applications yesterday um, overnight and they talked to, to scores of people yesterday. They're going to be making contact with everybody personally to try and encourage them through. So that's really positive and that's already starting to pay dividends. Yeah, that is um, good. Sickness, then final slide. Um, I guess I think the main thing about the sickness is, as you can see, we would we are anticipating as we get towards November, December, we'll probably see a rise in uh, cold and flu uh, as we normally do at this time, this time of year. It's pretty static. It's risen slightly over the course of the year, um, but everybody's back in the workplace again now. Um, so we probably anticipate a slight rise going into the winter months. And that's about it for me. <laughs> Sorry, that was such a really a quick canter through it, but there we go. OK, well, thank you very much, Elliot. Um, I am conscious of time, too. Uh, so thanks for cantering through that. Um, so going on to the agenda. So uh, under item six, questions from the public. There are no further questions. Uh, agenda item seven, any other business? No, any other business. Um, so it just leaves agenda item eight, date of the next meeting, which is the 20th of October. So many thanks to everybody who's taken part. Um, we have, I have a special thank you to say to Tom Thorpe, who works in my office. It's his last meeting with us today. I'd like to say to Tom, you know, thank you very much for your time doing all these PAM meetings, your great scrutiny questions, very much appreciated. We shall miss you very much. Okay, many Happy thanks everyone for watching. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.